I'm certainly, you know, one of a, you know, one of a handful that's, you know, you know, very actively engaged in it. And, and that's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of people involved uh, over, I'm you know, very grateful for that across the world. Um, I'm probably one of the leading lecturers on it. I do. <laughs> well, I was awesome. until COVID-19 hit. Um, well, the, sure. I mean, you know, but um, you know, I do, 30, 40 lectures a year, you know, all around the country. Oh my goodness. And, um, wow. So what a passion. Wow. Very good. Thank you for being here. All right. I got everything recording. Um, I had to get Darla set up. She's about to go to the, uh, get our laundry done. All right, Scott, you want to, you want to, uh, you want to, um, wait, maybe I should pray. And then, uh, sure, yeah, yeah. Go ahead and do some prayer, brother. Abba, Father, here we are, Father, gathered in your name, and we exalt you in your mighty name, Father. As we do this presentation, Father, seal us in this meeting that you would keep us from the enemy, that he has no access to us, Father. We ask that you reveal yourself in a mighty way, Father, right now, and, and as a testimony to your hidden codes, Father. Let Russ see uh, how magnificent and mighty you are and how everything Everything in your plan, Father, you have great detail. And you've put it there for us to find. We give you all the glory and praise in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Right. We are recording. So, Scott, if you want to take it away, brother. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. No, certainly. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> right, right. Um, no, really. Um, thank you so much for being here, Russ, because, you know, how could anybody not as a believer just be infatuated with this with this story with the shroud and uh, it's something that I've always been uh, very fascinated with and just um, on a on a on a happenstance day when I never thought the spirit would come to me and say look for the shroud uh, in the Aramaic Kushida it, it's just it was just beyond me and um, and it was like it was like well of course you know it makes perfect sense because I love this story and um, you know, although, albeit this, what we do is a very uh, different area of research to have you come in and be able to maybe put our gifts and our areas of research together, together to provide um, a strengthened witness. Isn't that what our father does, you know, uh, to his truth and, and, and all truth? He strengthens it. He strengthens his truth. So to have like-minded believers here doing this is, is such a blessing and be able to show you this is it's a great joy for us um what i'll do is i'll go ahead and share my screen and show you what I, um, okay. what he has shown us here and now keep in mind this is the aramaic Peshitta. yeah i've told him okay. we're not in the hebrew tanakh we're, we're actually there's a program that has made it available to look at the equidistant coding in the Peshitta, which relies on a hebrew construct that's why we're able, I, actually the programs, you can do it in any, in the Greek text and the English, but it's just more profound in the original texts. And what you're going to see, here, let me see if I can minimize this. So it's, okay, here we go. Now, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay, very good. Um, the word shroud is in Hebrew, tau here in the red going horizontally. You see it? Mm-hmm. Over the, through the overlapping lines here, it's going horizontally. That's very significant because it means. So it is. It is a different word, Russ, than we were seeing in the uh, the negative sense in the in the Masuk. Right. Yeah. What's the word here? It's it's Tech Greek. It's Tau Kaf Resh Yod Kaf, and the the final Kaf lands in the word for linen wrappings in the Aramaic. Wow. In, um, in John, now we're in John, very in a very profound place for this to be found. It's it's John chapter nineteen, uh, yeah. verses verses forty verse through verse forty one. They they took the body of Yeshua and bound it in the linen wrappings. And the last calf. I don't know. I hope that was mine. And you'll also have this word bet, calf resh, which is the word for firstborn or first fruit, encoded the first. over the top of that. He's the and, first fruits of the resurrection. Yeah. Yes, sir. And in my methodology, which is something that I usually do is I look at, at vertical coding because it's very, you know, the father knows that our um, ascetics uh, please our eye very much. So I'm constantly looking for just the straight 
vertical terms. And um, you'll see this very interesting term at a very small page width at 119. So basically, Russ, if I took two pieces of graph paper from the store and laid them lengthways and taped them together, I could probably fit 119 characters in each row. Is that fair, be fair to say? You would sure. say so. If you started doing that in the Aramaic Peshitta, this is what you would see at a vertical position here, these perfect terms that come together vertically. In other words, let me break it down for you. In other yes. words, Bring this home, is brother. very, very small area. 119 yes. is a small skip. We're not stretched across the whole Bible. We're, we're focused. It's like John, the hand of John recording this is inspired right. by the Holy Spirit to encode this. So this is how. So it's not only in the Torah. The Jews will tell you it's only in the Torah. I disagree. The Holy Spirit moves through these men who, who pen these, and it's evident in the coding there. Okay, so right. very small area. It's incredible. So you'll find the same word again, the shroud, um, uh, encoded or like diagonally here that goes through the text of this diagonal line, and it lands in an area right here where when I look for this word Torin, it just so happens to be the same modern Hebrew spelling for the word uh, Torin, and that's Praetorium in the Aramaic. That's when they're in the, 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 the living quarters of Pilate. It's called a Praetorium in Latin. Uh -huh. And it just so happens to be the same modern spelling as the town of Torin, hmm. or as, as you well know, it's this where the shroud is preserved today. Um, the Where's vertical the Vatican, coding. Where is it exactly, Russ? In the Cathedral of Saint John the Baptist, in a in a, in a kind of in a flat box. Uh, it's all steady state uh, temperature, uh, um, uh, humidity, argon gas. So it's not out for viewing. You can only view it about once every ten years when they when they have an exhibition. Oh wow. Okay, so. So you want to, you want to, that's a touring, correct? Yes. Yeah. Wow. And there's some really cool things that take place in the vertical coding where it says here in the time of my resurrection, going through where the linen wrappings are mentioned. And then you have here, as you know, the face cloth, which is commonly known as the sudarium, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I believe yeah. that's the, the, um, the Latin, um, enunciation, right? Yes. Yeah, it's, but here in the Aramaic, you have the Sudera, and you have to the prophet and hand it out an eye. And what I thought was cool about this anomaly here, the same thing shows up in the court coding here is for to the prophet, and he was our, our high prophet, mm -hmm. as long as our, um, along with our high, being our high priest and king. Uh, but I wanted to show you guys, this is new further. What you're about to look at is the same <laughs> matrix at the same page with not annotated this is laid up in my program you'll be able to recognize the same anomalies here um is it showing yes okay this is where it says in the time of my resurrection now over here at a at a at a row skip of two at the same vertical um um characteristics here going vertically up and down it says from death he will rise or from from the rising rising from his death um kum is kumi or kum to rise and then a yod mem vav tau is his death rising from his death mm. and then here at another this very interesting uh vertical anomaly here it says atan which means i shall give aleph tau noon and then or which is light i shall give light and then obri which is it means typically it means Hebrew, but it means to cross or to pass. So this says, I gave them the light of my crossing. And I don't know, Les, maybe you can kind of validate in your research that I believe that this image he left for us was through by means of light, waves of light. Um, oh, maybe, yeah, I would I would agree with that. I, I think um, that's probably the most the the prevailing theory among those that that obviously that that believe the shroud to be authentic yes okay because then if you put in the word light um it does appear there where the shroud appears right here at this aleph and it skips 
over the linen wrappings that then if you put in the word the wave of like a wave of light um, we're just going to do a real-time search here and I can show you how it appears I didn't want to do it this way because the table can get very cluttered if you don't know what you're looking at I don't want to get people too um, carried away here with um, how it looks but that's what that says right there the wave of light and then you have here this word here is hey shin shin right beneath it means in the linen and then over here vertically i was just looking for relevant terms um the veil and this is really cool here this vertical term over here to the left is uh, zalem which is zadi lamid mem it means the image it means tau noon which means to give like natan the image given to and then look it says adam man aleph dalit Man, the image given to man, and then here in the plain text is where um, Pilate says, "Behold your king." Where you get it from? Oh wow, that's um yes, uh, that's in John nineteen fourteen where he says, and it was in preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Yahudim who are in the English, the Jews, "Behold your king." Right there in the plain text where it says, "The image given to man." Wow. Behold your king. Um, yes, the just at a very such a very short page skip, we're seeing um, such great witnesses to what uh, um, the image is and how it was there. Because you know, as you know, the, the scientific community their their hammer was forced in on national television. They were forced to say, "Well, we don't know what the image is." They had to say it, and you know, in your research, I'm sure. You could probably give us a reason as, you know, why our Heavenly Father was able to do such a beautiful thing and kind of put them in a place to, to have to admit that. and Evidence, man. We live in a time where everything yes. is called into question. They doubt this. They doubt that. It's fake, fake. You can't deny science. And, and, and that's what codes is. <laughs> Matter of fact, I, you, I call it a biblical forensic tool. It's, it's a mathematical uh, way of verifying. And as you sure. see here, the and, encoded text is absolutely verifying what is taking place in that text, right? It, it's, it's like a, a facet of a diamond. And here's the thing, brother, just to add to that, I didn't mean to cut you off, but just to let Russ know, when you, when Jonathan first got a hold of you, we got together the other night and I had to show some tables. I had just worked on this today briefly in between coming home from work and getting cleaned up and having some supper just quickly looking for some terms. Me and my brother Jeremiah were here, and I was like, Maya, brother, what should we look for? We'll just, just be led by the Spirit. And I looked for the word light, and usually I saw the word light here where you can see my mouse appear vertically. And as I always do in my methodology, I instantly look vertically, and I says, well, that says giving light. And that says a very Hebrew, it means crossing. I shall give the light of my crossing. So when there was a transfiguration there, or as you know, as we think a transformation, something happened where the body and the and the, the sudera and the and the uh, the tekarik, the shroud were, were neatly placed and folded, and the body was gone, and there he appears down here, and and um, he stood in the midst right during the resurrection. Now check this out: if I put in the word resurrection, um. It'll appear again attached to the word resurrection. See, at a skip. Wow. See, mm -hmm. tachit. Now it's the same word. You can end it with a hey or a tau. It's a little ambiguous, but it has the same meaning. It just one gives a, a more um, a physical plural meaning, maybe. Um, there's a difference between a hey and a tau. One's feminine, I think, and one's another. But it just it means the same word. It's just there attached to itself. And, um, wow. you know, these terms with, with no, not forcing, without digging my brain, without sitting here scratching my head, my brother and I just thought of, well, what made this image? Was it a light? Was there, you know, he says that he is the light of the world. Doesn't it make sense that there was brilliant light taking place when this manifestation happened? I mean, would you agree? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, um, well, when you look at, you know, just the, just the plain text, um, yes. you know, there were no eyewitnesses to the resurrection and there's a reason for that. Um, right. And so, you know, in Deuteronomy 1915, it, it says that the truth of a matter is established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Amen. 
And so, but here we have the resurrection, the ultimate miracle, and no eyewitnesses. And, and that's because, because the, the question is not, not who are the witnesses, but what are the witnesses? Yeah. And the right. first witness is the empty tomb, for sure. But that's not enough. And so the second witness has to be the linen cloth lying there that in the tomb that caused John to believe that Jesus had risen. And right. then the third witness must be the napkin that was about his head, which we know as the Sudarium, which is in, in Oviedo, Spain. And so there are your three witnesses. And, but if you were to ask the question of what happened to Jesus in the tomb, then you'd have to answer it by looking at other verses of scripture. And the first one you go to is the Mount of Transfiguration, which is before the crucifixion, where Jesus goes up to the hill and he's in this, in the scripture says his face was transfigured, was transfigured and, and, his, um, and his face shone like the sun itself and his clothing became dazzling light. And so, and then the other one I always reference is how did he, how did he, how did he appear to Saul who became Paul on the road to Syria, but in a blinding flash of light. So I always say this to people. So if you, you know, based on those two verses, if you ask the question of what happened to Jesus in the tomb, the very split second, his soul came zooming back into his body. I think you'd have to assume that there was an explosion of light and then right. gone. And then, um, so, so absolutely light is involved. Yes. Very and, good. you know, it's interesting. You mentioned the word crossing, the image of my crossing. Yes. Um, uh, you know, it's, I guess indeed Jesus, Jesus, you know, crossed from the physical into the spiritual. And at that moment where time and eternity met, there was this right. explosion of light <laughs> that got imprinted on a linen cloth. And it's... Um, so, um, has there been any attempt to make an educated guess, a a hunch, a to their best scientific possible research knowledge of what it could be, or are they up to this day still stumped about what this image is? Up to this day. All right. So, in other words, do they still think that this was a painted? Uh, that this was painted? Well, it, you, you, no, there's, I mean, there's, there's, it's, it's, it's not painted uh, because there's no paint on it. The, um, well, I mean, you know, the, 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 the you, you said, always, they, you, you always have detractors, the, yeah, the veritable, I mean. they, they, oh yeah, you they, have they, the veritable naysayers. Some that kind was, of um, uh, dye or something that was painted on to, you know, but it, it's in a negative. You know, yeah, to, that, I mean, some kind of unknown medieval artistic process that we're not aware of, you know, I mean, you know. It would the, be pretty diabolical for somebody to hoax this in, in ancient times. It's, it's, it's impossible. So the thought of someone painting it on there just doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't sit yeah. No, and, and it, it's, it's clearly not the work of an artist, and it's, there is no artistic substances on the cloth to account for the image, and, and there's just so many details related to it that, you know, that, that make it rather ludicrous to suggest that this is the work of some That's a good medieval word. artist. However, having said that, that doesn't mean that we know how the image got there. We know aspects of the image, but no one knows the process of resurrection. Um, any, right. any, any more than you and I know how the word of God, you know, turned into a human being. <laughs> we, we don't understand right. that either. Right. So, um, but this is, um, but you know, I, I'm taken by scriptures where, you know, where Old Testament, no one ever saw the face of God, not even Moses. No one saw the face of God. New Testament everybody sees the face of Jesus. And, yes. and in G and Paul, he writes and says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the express manifestation of his being. And then in, in Corinthians, he writes and says that the, that, that the glory of God is revealed in the face of Christ. So when you look on in going back to, um, on the Mount when Moses was getting the stone tablets and it probably at some point nearing the end of the 40 days, he says, 
he says to God, now show me your glory. And God answers him back and says, no one can see my glory and live. Or he says, no one can see my face and live. So the question was, Moses says, show me your glory. God answers back and says, no one can see my face and live. And you know that that story, he hides him in a rock, in a cleft of a rock, and, 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 and God passes by so that he can see his backside. So where is the glory of God revealed in his face? New Testament, it says that the glory of God is revealed in the face of Christ. And so my question is for some of my, you know, some of the naysayers is, why is it such a stretch to believe that God would have preserved this image for all time? And especially for the 21st century at a time when we communicate more with images than we do with words. Everything is images now. And it's, um, so it just seems to me that, that, that God has preserved it, you know, as a, as a way of speaking, you know, as an image, it doesn't, you know, I believe it's a gospel written on, on linen that testifies that a life suffering death and resurrection of Jesus, just the same as, same as the four gospels do. But as an image, it, it, it speaks every language and has no need to be translated. Everybody knows who it is. Everyone knows what it is. Even if they don't believe, they still know who it is. Man, that's a good point. And uh, what I wanted to do here was show when, uh, when, we ha when I had first presented this, um, it was in January 1st. Um, so it was right at the turn of the Gregorian year, shortly before uh, the biblical Abib here this year. On January 1st, wow, of all days, um, is when I saved this. I, I think I had looked at this, this maybe a few days in advance, I don't know, before I actually saved this annotation. And then this is here what it's evolved to. Um, I don't know if I'm back on my code program yet. Yeah, you are. Um, Okay, yeah, to what you were just mentioning, Ross, is the, the image left here, right here in the plain text where it says, Behold your king. You have the That's image powerful. given the image given to a man. And I suppose, you know, the context of that could be pointed towards the image as a man that he was here as, or the image that he left for a man. Either way, he's equally significant connotations. Yeah. Um and, you know, it's really a joy for me to show you this, brother, because I'm sure you like to see interesting witnesses. And, and really, this is why the coding exists, because like you said, the word came alive and this is a very much a living word. So, I mean, should it really boggle people or should they really have to question that this word is encoded? I mean, of course it is. This is just scratching the surface. People just don't understand. You know, we're when they try to write it off. Elohim who spoke to a man in a burning bush, right? So it is not yeah. upon him to speak to his people in his text, to reveal himself in his text. So just to reiterate to people, at a, just had a page width of 119 characters in the Aramaic Peshitta in John chapter 19 through 20, you will see it say, in the time of my erection, I gave them the light of my crossing, going over the, lin the linen wrappings, wearing it, you will find encoding um, the tekarik, the shroud, um, going at a, a 17 letters, landing right here in the linen wrappings. That's that's not. Now, that what is, is that divine. verse right there, Scott? That I see Yeshua's name in there. Um, so right. what is what's actually being said in that? Here, where it's coded, the shroud. Yeah, right in that that's, verse there. That's okay. They bore away the body of Yeshua and wound it in the lemon, linens and the aromatics. The aromatics will be your, your spices and your burial spices. That's Ra Ramsel method, um, brother. That's what I'm talking about, yeah. Russ. You see mm -hmm. how the two are corresponding. It's, right. It's speaking to one another. Yes, the underlying coding is, it's like DNA. It's like looking at flesh. It's like looking at DNA inside of flesh, inside of carbon uh, it's flesh. Structure. It's, it, it's, Yes. You could look at this and not know what the text was and see the structure of this rust and see that there's intelligent design here. It's not mm -hmm. scattered and it's like pixeled everywhere. That's a that's a random occurrence of some nonsense. But this right. has a fingerprint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then um, 
it'll go on to say, and then there was a garden in the place where Yeshua was crucified, and then the garden, a new sepulcher, in which no person had ever been laid. So <clears throat> we're right there, and we're, we're having in the surface text, text description of what's taking place during the burial and what objects are there. The Shroud of Turin, um, you have the Shroud encoded over top of that, and you know, just... Um, you know, looking into the word and doing what, what we do, this is what we've come up with for you. And um, I see that line on, on top of that, too. That, that one on top of that, I see Yeshua's name in that. I don't know what's going on in the story. It's all over. In the, yeah, his name's uh, all over it in the plain text. Yeah. Um, this exactly. word here, <laughs> this word here in the same line as, as shroud is the, the raiment. Um, a bet gimel dalit, and it also means disguise or to come in camouflage. Or I recently heard uh, I uh, Eric Bissell talking about this, um, and how it applies to the um, the um, alphabet, which is the OTO, which means which is the things arriving. Um, I really kind of, when you look at things in in that lens and and how he embodies the the Hebrew construct, it really. It takes on a lot more definition. I don't know if you're familiar with um, the Hebrew acrostics and the, and the contronyms and such, but when you apply it in this way to other things, things start to really come out in the wash, you know. Um, but anyways, yeah. yeah, no, that's it's fascinating. I was um, I was sharing with Jonathan b before you got on, Scott, about the. Uh, I didn't, we didn't really find too much there, but it, I still think, I think that's worth looking at is um, Isaiah 25, six through eight, which talks about um, the shroud, uh, not necessarily the shroud of Turin, but the shroud uh -huh. um, that, um, that Jesus wore. And, um, you know, and um, the, it goes like this um, in the, in the, well, you have it there and the, um, <clears throat> And in, in, in verse 7, um, it, it says on this, well, I'm looking at NIV. It says, on this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds mm -hmm. all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. Oh, yeah. And, and I, I've, I've, when, when I look at how Jesus, under the, under the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, that, that, you know, he is our substitute. He lived the life that we couldn't live you know, the sinless life. He suffered in our place. He died in our place. He was burial. He was wrapped in a burial shroud in our yeah. place. Yeah. And, and, but he defeated death. I mean that, so in other words, he destroyed the shroud that covers all nations, that, 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 yes. that shroud that covers all nations is a shroud of right. death. He yeah. destroyed the shroud of death that That's covers true. all nations. And, and so, so his his atoning blood marks that cloth, but then also his image of his resurrection. You know, you know, no one ever escapes their burial shroud, but Jesus did, and um, and so do we because of Jesus. And it's um, I think I just thought that there was something, probably something there, but you know, um, and maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Um, but um, yeah, when you look at that, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Got a, That's a, a word to look for. I would think it came to me while, while we were talking with Shekinah. Um, would be a good mm. kind of, yeah, Shekinah. Uh, how Shekinah is that? Glory. Uh, how, is that with a shin hat? No, it's, it's a shin kaf, uh, the K, the C. Yes. Okay. Shin, shin kaf, yod nun hey, as in, as in Harry. Um, oh, Shekinah. Okay, there Shekinah. we go. Yeah. It's probably there. Um. Yeah, because what was that light that was um, the cause, you know, that was associated with the resurrection, you know? The, that Shekinah glory is, is attributed to the, the, you know, the brightness of his, uh, of his, there it is, it's there, huh? Yeah, it's there several times. Is there a truncated version of that? You can take the... Um, the yod out. Mm -hmm. um, it is there. Yeah. 
Shekinah is there. It's. I would have to, to dig through and kind of yeah, stitch it's there them several out. times. Yeah. So what we yeah. look for, Russ, is proximity and and, mm -hmm. and smaller skips. Yeah. That's a good proximity right there. Mm -hmm. What's that word? That's Shekinah. That's oh. Shekinah glory right there in Yeshua, yeah. in the plain text right there. Yeshua's name sure is. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Um, and his face, his face, Pena. Yeah. So what face. we see, Russ, with multiple occurrences, if he showed you all of them at once, it would look like it was just yeah. things all over. So we like to isolate each individual one and look yeah. for the closest proximity, smaller skip. But what? But the, the reason why I think we see so many sometimes, and it's not always. Sometimes you'll see many of a word. Sometimes mm -hmm. you'll only see one time, right? I think we're right. looking at something like it's called resonance, like ripples in a pond. Like imagine, you know, his, his, his Shekinah is rippling through the text. So we're seeing mm -hmm. it in other places as well. It may not have proximity to the, to the term, but it does somewhere else in the text. So right. at least that's, that's how I got it from the Holy Spirit of, of because we, we go down these rabbit trails and say, okay, why do you do this, Father? Why is it like this? Why is this here? Like every little detail we've been we've been trying to figure why he's done this. To give clues like this right here, you'll see Shin. It's had a long skip going horizontally, but it's there. Um, shin, Resh, Pei, which means burning. And then if you look here, you have light um, going vertically. Four. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah. So you have you have burning. Oh, it wouldn't come up. You have burning, burning light. Oh wow, burning that's, light. That's I don't have a highlighted, but you see where my mouse is. That's Aleph Bob Resh inside of the word burning. Burning light, waves of light. And that's all There's, in one verse, right? That's all in one verse, yeah. The, the, the wave of light, the first fruit right there. He is from death, he has risen through the prophet, the hand of Adonai. I have given the light of my crossing or the light of my passing in the time of my resurrection. Going over, they have bore away the body of Yeshua and wound it in linens and aromatics as in the customs of the Yahudim to bury going over the fine linings where it's encoded, where it says the shroud, uh, tech, calf, resh, yod, calf, the shroud. You know what we have yeah. here is we have one witness verifying another witness. Yes. Right. We have the codes, which is a witness, verifying the shrouds, which is a witness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just mm -hmm. boggles my mind. Yeah. Yes. I love to see in these times where I was like, I kind of had um, was talking to Jonathan and mentioned this on the last time, one of the last times we were together during a live stream is that it's nice to see the end time believers coming together and sharing the gifts that the father has get, has given them and kind of come together and, and just strengthen what he's given us. And um, it's such a, it's a, it's a joy to see. Um, so, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've always looked at the shroud as a, as a, as a vehicle for evangelism, and, sure. um, you know, just to reach out to, I mean, when I think of what the message of the shroud is, I always relate it back to the message of doubting Thomas. Yeah. And, um, it's always going to be one. So the, uh, right. you know, just as, just as Thomas, you know, he wasn't there the first time Jesus was there in the upper room. And then a week later, He's there. Jesus shows up again, and you know, and the first person Jesus speaks to is Thomas. And, you know, because Thomas. he came specifically back for Thomas, uh, brother. Yeah, I think I think you're right. And then, um, and then, and then, you know, and then Thomas, once he's face to face with the resurrected Christ, then you know, forever known as doubting Thomas, now says, you know, my Lord and my God, which is the strongest profession of faith in the entire New Testament. 
And so the, what's, what's curious is that, is that for whatever reason, in spite of the testimony of all of his best friends who said, it's true, Thomas, we, you know, he was here. We've seen the Lord. We touched him. You know, we broke bread. He talked about the kingdom. It was amazing. <laughs> Where were you? And then, um, and then, and so in spite of the testimony of all of his best friends, he still would not believe until he was face to face with the resurrected Christ for himself. Then he goes on to make sure that, that proclamation, my Lord and my God. And you see, I think that's the message of the shroud to the world. I, I think that God in his mercy, you know, basically has allowed this to be preserved and to be revealed through modern science. And like I said earlier, now at a time when we communicate more with images than we do with words. I mean, it's so, so God, um, I, I do think that the shroud is an end time message. Um, I, I've, uh, I usually uh, conclude my shroud encounters. So shroud encounter is the name of my website, but it's also the name of my presentation. It's called shroud encounter. And it's um, and every shroud encounter is designed to be a Christ encounter. And, you know, at the end, I always say, you know, that the, that the, that the, that the message of the shroud is past, present, and future. It's past because it brings us back to a historical event, the physical resurrection of Jesus. It's future because it refers to a future event. Now, in the, in the, in the, in the course of a presentation, when I will all already have talked about 1 Corinthians 15, where Jesus, where Paul writes and says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep. That means to remain dead, but we will all be changed. How? In the twinkling of an eye, in a flash, it says in the, in the NIV that for, you know, and then it basically, you know, says for, for that, which is incorrupt, that which is corruptible must put on incorruptible and that which is perishable must put on imperishable. So, so, so Paul is talking about an instantaneous transformational event in the future. That hasn't happened yet. But of course, that's exactly what happened to Jesus in the tomb, because as you've already pointed out, that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. And um, so it represents a future event. I think the shroud is literally a snapshot of that future event, of our own resurrection, if you will. And then course the message is also present it in the in the now on the cloth we see the price that was paid and it's um and um so uh, do I'll you have just, a trial encounter presentation a zoom version not a zoom version i i we just we just filmed a new one the other day it's not edited yet um but it would be, I'm, I'm thinking about doing some things on Zoom like this. Um, and, well, my, my thought was maybe you could come to, to um, a class and um, do a presentation for students. I had Jim Barfield from the Copper Scroll Project um, come and he, he actually talked and then he took questions afterwards. Um, he had like a, well, it was a PowerPoint, but it was a Zoom version. All he, all he did was just kind of go through his... Uh, is, yeah, uh, I got to figure out. I'm I'm still in the figuring out mode as to how to do all that, and it's yeah. um, um, the because I think it would be a good thing to do. Um, the uh, I, I, I'm gonna. This is another really cool thought that people love about this is that, you know, um, you know there there are four words that are commonly used to describe what the shroud is. It's called a relic. It's called an artifact. It's called a mystery. It's called a symbol. All those words are fine, but they really don't tell you very much. And I got to thinking there has to be a different concept. And so I really began searching the scriptures for all the words that describe what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. And there are four of them. And you know them. We have been bought, purchased, redeemed, ransomed. There are, those are the four words. All four of those words are words of transaction. A transaction has occurred. A payment has been made on our behalf. And so I got to thinking, you know, when you go to a store and you purchase anything, what does the cashier always give you? Receipt. There's evidence of that purchase. Exactly. And what is a receipt? It's that proof of purchase, purchase right? What's on the receipt? The, the price you paid, right? So when Peter and John ran to the tomb and saw the linen cloth lying there, what did they see? They saw the receipt. They saw the proof of purchase. Awesome. And when they opened it up, what did they see? They saw the price that was paid. 
And so you see, not only is the shot a receipt, it's an itemized receipt documenting everything that was paid. The yeah. crown of thorns, scourging all over the body, then was in the wrist and the, and the feet, wound in the side, bruises on the face, abrasions on the knees and on the shoulders. Everything that was paid to purchase our salvation is on the receipt. Yeah. And so that's the real meaning of the shroud, in my opinion. That's incredible. Yeah, um, I think you're right, brother. I think it is absolute um, evidence. It's a receipt, uh, as, as you put it, which is a very good way to put it. You need to when I and then, it. and then you can think of it logically. You know, clearly when you look at those four words, bought, purchased, redeemed, ransom, clearly a transaction has occurred. There must be a record of the transaction. The question is, what is it and where is it? And I think there's only one candidate. Yeah. And I think that's why that this, is, this is even mentioned in the text in the first place, because it does play a role. Um, right. That's beautifully put, brother. Hallelujah. Thank you. Well, Scott, let me, um, you know, I, I, I want to get with both of you a little bit more, at, at, you know, and get in, in the, the, the challenge that I have I'm writing this book. And I don't, it's to how to articulate what we've talked about, how to, how to take that and actually, you know, articulate it into some succinct paragraphs without, without freaking people out with all these graphs and charts and stuff. And, and um, so that's, that's going to be my challenge. And so I, I, I may want to, you know, get back with you and, 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 and just say, you know, you, when the, all the things that you pointed out, how do we, how do, you know, how do we phrase it so that people, sure. you know, comprehend it? Well, the, the best way is probably usually just with like the visual annotations that I showed you. And by the way, Russ, you're free to, to share anything that I have provided visually for your research, brother. No okay, questions well, asked. You. It's a blessing for us that the father has placed somebody as a steward of uh, the research of this to me. I mean, I'll just admit it. I stand biased in favor of it. Sure, I do. I admit it. But let me ask you a question. How could anybody not be? Look at all that just is in favor of it and how profoundly amazing it is and what the father has done here. And sure, like I'm all excited to uh, promote any area or anybody who's pushing research for this um it's great so feel free to to share my annotations anytime and i'll make sure that you have a few copies russ and there's um no, yeah there's no future event predicted in this presentation at all uh, right as a matter right. of fact it was all in frenzy was all looking inward uh in, in the actual text no it's all that looking is, historically at method. what happened right exactly yes. and it's um, Ranzo method and this is so, why the text is encoded in the first place so how do um, i go back and replay this to kind of take some notes we're going to upload this to, to uh to youtube um i may put it on unlisted i may go ahead and publish it this is good content but i'll, okay. I'll send you a, a link to that uh in, in your email in, uh, okay all right great great right. perfect yeah perfect yeah, and we can well, also get still shots or screenshots of anything. And I didn't even show you what I have. Um, I just I thought it would be important just to, to look at the 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 Peshitta, um, because what I have is going to be from the Tanakh, which the whole of the word testifies unto him. So right. we can find evidence of yeah. um, the shroud in, also in the in the Tanakh as well. But um, for this presentation, I, I wanted you to see what was in the, the Peshitta. This is. Uh, new territory for code searchers and other yeah. it hasn't always been something we could search um, but right the uh, makers of code finder have it have it stands it. the reason that it's all the word of god and there's you know if yes. the old testament searchable why wouldn't the new and it's, that's exactly uh, you know, it it's yeah. all it's all written under the inspiration of the same holy spirit so there's right. no reason right so amen and you know at first i was very intimidated when i started digging for and searching for myself, myself and like Chris and some of the other students and Jonathan as well, we were trying to bridge the gap between the New Testament and the Tanakh and with the same searchable terms in relevant areas of scripture that tie together both tables and we, all of us as a group collectively with so many other just wonderful spirit led um, people as a group of students and as a group of you know, some teachers, some students, and just 
regardless as a group, just getting together and digging into the word in this fashion. I've just been able to come up some and to be able to share with the people out there, you know, doing this research and actually with the people with the boots on the ground out there doing the archaeology out there going to places out there going to, to talking to people and doing their part to provide for the body. We see you out there and thank you so much again for being here, Russ. It's, it's a blessing for us. Well, absolutely. And, and, and Scott, how do I get a hold of you if I want to reach out to you for more? Uh, for more people? Well, I'm on Facebook, my first and last name. Um, and then you can get a hold of me through Jonathan, and I'll make sure that there are. You got, you got there an email, are, Scott? What, what email are you? Are you using an email? Let him, let him get an email from me. Uh, well, okay. I don't, if, if you're going to put this on YouTube, maybe you don't want to do that. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll get, I'll get a message passed to you, Russ, okay? Uh, okay. And, we, and then we can correspond um, likewise. And, okay. And, and yeah, we'll, we'll take it from there. But I'll be sure you have the, um, the annotations that you need, okay, brother? Okay. All right, and great. Then, great. Anytime, anytime you want to go over anything, either myself or Jonathan, or yeah, and I, I want to see more of what you got too, Jonathan, from the uh, from the Tanakh. Absolutely. So, um, so, Amen. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity to get with you guys and to uh, I've been I've been excited to hear. But I've always felt that, well, Jonathan knows we talked about this five years ago that you know thought that there was wow. you know, something there you know in the Bible codes about this. There, I mean, there just had to be. And um, so I'm kind of a rookie at the table with this, but, you know, um, the father is doing amazing things with his people these days. And, you know, for him to have brought me together with these group of brothers here, Chris over there, he's been kind of quiet. Yeah. So now, I do want to, I do want to mention this. <laughs> yeah, I want to mention this to you. Cause I, cause you guys are all very much into the Hebrew. Um, the, I do a presentation called uh, secrets of the man clothed in linen. Wow. And in this presentation, um, I'm not sure I did it at that time when you and I met out there in Colorado Springs or if it was another time, right. but I was preparing for one of these prophecy conferences and I had already been out there uh, four or five times. And, and, you know, as a speaker, they always want new material because they, they, they videotape it and sell the DVDs and that's, you know, part of their revenue model and that's fine. So I was at this point, I was completely tapped out. I had nothing left to talk about with the shroud. I had already done it all. And so I'm literally, I have the Bible in my hands and I'm saying, Lord, if I'm supposed to do something, you're going to have to show it to me because I don't know what to do. And I literally, you know how you just open the Bible randomly and just see where it pops open to. Well, I did that. And it opens to Ezekiel 9. And there in Ezekiel 9, it talks about the man clothed in linen. And so I began to read, and I said, well, that sounds intriguing. And, and I said, oh, my gosh. And so uh, I immediately turned in the title of my talk. It was going to be Secrets of the Man Clothed in Linen. I had, no idea, I had no idea what I was doing at that point. I just knew that this was it. And, um, and so – but. What's, it, what's intriguing about this, and, you, know, you know, briefly, you know, you have this man clothed in linen who appears with six angels, all with slaughtering weapons in their hands. And this is, and this is happening at 586 BC. And, and God speaks to the man clothed in linen and says, he says, you know, you know go throughout the, this city and put a mark on the foreheads of all those who mourn and lament over all the detestable things that are being done. Because at this point, you know, Judah had completely fallen away from the faith. There was, you know, the they they were no longer worshiping in the in the in the temple, and and so and so then he speaks to the six angels with the slaughtering weapons in their hands, and he says, "Follow him. Follow the man clothed in linen, and whoever does not receive have the mark on their forehead." kill them man woman child spare no one show no mercy begin here at my temple and um, so i say whoa this is serious now that was what was happening in the spirit what was happening in the physical the babylonian army was invading from babylon they had breached the walls of the city and were in the process of destroying the city and destroying the temple so that that's what was happening in the physical and so so now, 
at any rate, I began to be thinking, and, and this and this man clothed in linen only shows up one other time, and that's in Daniel 12, at the end of the age, when he's about to judge the nations of the earth. So he shows up in 586 BC at the judgment of Judah. He shows up at the end of the age when he's about to judge the world. So I'm saying, my, my goodness, and all your commentaries say that this man clothed in linen is Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. Really? So, so, so I got the, so I'm, I'm thinking, okay, now I know this is related, we're related to the shroud, so I'm thinking, I'm racking my brain. So now I began to look at the, at the shroud, and I'm saying, well, here you have this front and back image of a five foot ten man, and the most prominent aspect of the image is the face. But the most prominent feature of the face is a blood stain right here on the middle of his forehead that looks like a Greek epsilon. And so Jesus is marked on his own forehead with his own blood. I mean, so I'm saying, who mourns and laments over all the detestable things that are being done on the earth more than Jesus? I mean, he's the one who died for our sins. And so that really intrigued me. Now, what's interesting from the Hebrew standpoint, I've had two um, interesting looks at that. Now, when you when you take that image of the of the of the blood, and you and you flip it in into the photo negative, it becomes what appears to be the number three. Now, which could be a sign for the Trinity, um, but I was at this prophecy conference, and I'm talking to a guy there afterwards, and he had lived in had had lived in Israel, and knew modern. Hebrew. And he says to me, well, it doesn't look like a three to me. And I said, well, what do you mean it doesn't look like a three? And he, and he says, well, to me, it looks like a Hebrew Dalit in that would be in, in, uh, in Hebrew cursive. And I'm, and I'm saying, and I said to him, yeah. And he showed it to me. I said, yeah, it does kind of look like a doll. I says, well, what does Dalit mean? It means door. Jesus is the door. Well, that freaked me out. I'm saying, man, well, man, how many verses are there where Jesus says, I am the door and come, you know, come in and out. You'll find, you know, find pasture. I am the way. And so, but then about two years later, I met with another guy who was very knowledgeable of modern Hebrew. And he says, well, kind of looks like a dollar, but to me, it looks more like a Hebrew sade. That's T-S-A-D-E. And the sade is the 18th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And I said, well, what, and, and I have to admit it, yeah, it probably does look a little more like a sade. It says, well, what does that mean? It means righteous one. And, I, and I'm saying, well, my goodness, I mean, certainly Jesus is the righteous one. And now here's the, here's the, here's the kicker on all this is that I don't know if, you know, Jesus is certainly the door and he's certainly the righteous one. So I don't know if it's a Dalit or a Sade or maybe it maybe both, who knows. Um, but when you go to Revelation 22.4, it's the last chapter of the book, it says that we will see him. We will be, you know, he, and it says that his name will be on our foreheads. What's his name? It's the righteous one. I think that we have been made righteous in him. And so I think, personally, that we're going to receive a mark that looks an awful lot like that mark that's on the forehead that we see on the shroud. I think it's probably a Hebrew sade in modern, in modern Hebrew cursive, which means righteous one. Well, I don't know. I just think that's pretty cool. It looks like a Zadi, huh? I've been, I've never seen that. Um, I thought you were going to say Shin or something like that. No, Hebrew Zadi. I I have to find. Um, I I don't have one right in front of me here. Hold hold on a minute. Hang on, and I'll show it to you. I think Brother Scott just dropped out. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. So in the photo negative, now here's the here's the photo negative of the face. Yeah. And we're gonna zoom down. I don't know where my camera is on this thing. Right, right in here. See this epsilon? See that? Yep. 
that is the that looks like the number three, but it's um, but it could be a Hebrew sade or a Hebrew dalit, depending on what you want to look at in the modern cursive. And the interesting thing about that is the uh, the uh, the current cursive version of modern Hebrew came into use in the uh, in the late 1800s. It was developed in Germany. And that's exactly the same time in which the Shah was photographed for the very first time in 1898. And that's when they, they found that the image on the cloth look in the, in the photo negative looked like this yeah. instead of that very vague and, and blurry looking image that we see on the cloth itself. I just think that's kind of intriguing. And so who knows if that's, if they're, but I, I just kind of look at some of those kind of uh, possible prophetic implications. Absolutely. Do you guys got anything else you want to share with Russ before we break out? Um, yeah. Uh, in a more contemporary uh, time frame, we still have Gaudi Thomases in our, in our society today. Even the shroud uh, is still a questionable. Um, and you talked about the question of what happened in the tomb as, as far as the resurrection. I had a, a vision about that in the two witnesses. And when they lay die, uh, dead on the streets in Jerusalem for three days, they're not going to be buried in a tomb. But yet we'll, we see in, in scripture how they're resurrected. And I believe that Yahusha is going to show the world how he was, he was resurrected in the tomb. That question is eventually going to be answered soon <laughs> that was what i was pretty much yeah i, I, I believe that That's there's a connection here between that and the two witnesses in revelation 11. Mm. yeah it could be you know it's um it's um i mean what do do we think that the two witnesses are are uh, enoch and elijah i mean i've heard that a lot you know it's um yeah yeah so <laughs> yeah, that's something we reconcile with yeah. the codes because the most common misconception is because of the Mount of Transfiguration that it's Moses and Elijah. Um, but in which I believe that's what I believe before I, I found out that it was actually Enoch and Elijah. And it makes sense, yeah, because cause those are the only two that have not tasted death, right? And so, and, so and, and now they and now they will. Now, it's, Moses has already died. Is, it, right. is he going to taste death? He's, he's forced to taste death twice? No, it's not him. It's not him. Right. And furthermore, they saw a vision of the kingdom to come. Now, if right. you back up one chapter to chapter 16, Yeshua says, there are some among you here that who will not taste death until they see the kingdom. Fast forward right. six days, Peter, James, and John see Yeshua and the kingdom. It's a vision. Right. This is how they, they see it before they died. That was so the they Mount of Transfiguration. A vision of the kingdom. They didn't see right. the two witnesses. They saw a vision of the kingdom. They saw Yeshua's. The, well, the, because the also was Yeshua's transfiguration. Because it, it would probably have to be Elijah and Enoch, because it, the scripture says it is, is appointed unto every man once to die in yes. the judgment. And so, um, yeah, so that that makes sense. The, they, they were um, the only two that were taken to heaven by chariots, yeah, as well. And, and so we know that they're still alive and, and we have this uh, vision of, of Zechariah 4 and also uh, Romans 11.25, the, the natural olive tree and the wild olive tree. Which is um, exactly what Enoch and Elijah yeah. would be. Yeah. Elijah was the only Hebrew. Um, Enoch was a, was a goy. He was a Gentile. So um, they're, they're the two, two witnesses, the two prophets. And it's and it's really, it's it's really in the model of a court procession. I mean, they are literally witnesses. And furthermore, I think they were their their own uh, for well at least for Enoch, he was put in the witness protection program because the fallen ones wanted to kill him. They wanted to corrupt him and kill him, so he didn't testify against them. In the end, there's a court hearing that's coming up, right? These these guys are going to be judged i'm talking about fallen angels right and you, if you put the pieces together from what's going on in enoch in the book of enoch mm -hmm. that he you took him that he's wrote down everything that's happened or 
from beginning to end, this is the only one that's been shown everything. Um, we've, we found in the codes that he's referred to as the Sofra Rabba, the, the great scribe. Hmm. So he's recording. He's also recording things, right? With a, with an inkhorn and, and whatever. So he's going to testify in the end, right? He and Elijah will come here and testify. And um, they so have to die in the streets because that is a, is a important piece of prophecy. That's going to be some, everybody's going to know this and they're going to see it. It's a witness. That's amen. And that, that I believe that uh, action that what we read about in revelation 11, about the death of the two witnesses we're, they're not even going to be put in the tombs and where that big answer of what happened in the tomb of Yahusha is going to be answered when they're resurrected after three days, everybody's going to see it. And it's going to testify to the whole world of who Yahusha is, and what happened, what really happened in the tomb. I think they're intentionally left into the street to see if they raise up because we're talking about basically two cultures in the middle East islam and, and and judaism and both buried dead within 24 hours it's immediate the body goes in the ground it is not left in the streets for three days but yet these two are they're probably in some area that where there's all kinds of hostilities between the jews and the palestinians and a lot of fighting going on it could be a lot of fighting and they just because you in the in the natural you wouldn't let two bodies lie there, so there has to be something going on that actually prevents them from, right. from burying the body, which I can probably assume is some kind of intense hostilities. That's a good point. I always thought about that. There was why they would be left in the streets in a culture, no matter who you are, whether you're Palestinian or whether you're Jewish. Right. The bodies are buried within 24 hours. There's no way they're left. Um, yeah, I just think it's because they can't get to them because of the warfare. And it's um, and both natural warfare as well as spiritual warfare. And, yeah. um, do you ever wonder why, the, uh, in terms of spiritual warfare, you ever wonder why the, the, the sun went dark from 12 noon to 3? Absolutely. Matter of fact, we're, we're studying that now um, in, in our class. We're doing a lot of research on Planet X. It is absolutely not the moon, brother, because the crucifixion had, happens at the time of the Passover, which is a full moon. We right. Don't have a lunar eclipse at a full moon. Right. And I even said this in the last, my last class. Why pastors and theologians never question this is beyond me because a lunar eclipse is only seven minutes well, I have, a, I have a theory that's different, though. I've heard the Planet X theory um, that, that, that comes in between the, um, the, the sun and, and Earth. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure that that would last three hours, though. Um, well, I mean, I would, look at the mathematics and, and what, okay, so you can, you can, we know the distance to the moon from the Earth, an object passing through there and blocking out, excuse me, the sun, blocking out the sun for three hours that can be calculated um using mathematics and ge geometry and stuff and you can know the size of this object based on that three hour um mathematics and it's massive so um this is no way the moon at all for, for oh, no, under, no no you're right i understand about that a normal eclipse the the moon enters the sun from the right side and it moves across the sun from right to left this object moved from left to right. And that's why it took so long to pass in front of the sun because it was all the sun, this object and the earth were all moving at the same time. This and is also you, what caused the yeah. earthquake that damaged the temple. It's recorded in the Talmud that at the time of Yeshua's uh, death, there's a massive earthquake and the temple was damaged. One of the doors yeah. would not remain. The gravitational closed. force would, yeah. could cause it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Um, so this is what we, we've been in Planet X theory, Wormwood. It's, just, it's a cyclical event. It happens in cycles, and it, and it causes cataclysm on the Earth. Uh, we also believe it's connected to Noah's flood and a few other now, things, the long what, day. What about this day. asteroid that's supposed to hit the Earth in 2029? Apophis. Apophis. Yeah, yeah Apophis, yeah. 
we're looking at that too. Um, yeah, I just saw I just saw that presentation the other day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> A little frightening. Yeah. I hope we're out of here by then. <laughs> well, it is Amen a, to that, it's brother. A, um, it's a it's a game changer at that point. It is a is a pivotal point in in prophecy because it becomes apparent to everyone at that point that something is going. So much like this coronavirus, which is to shake up the nations. It's to distress the nations. I, I saw right. something very interesting, brother, where. Not only did the shelves of toilet paper go bare, but in Walmarts across the nation, shelves of Bibles went bare. Now that needs to be noted. What's going on? People got shook up. Yeah. It's like, wait a minute. I read about this somewhere. Didn't I hear about this somewhere? Didn't some preacher say something about plagues? That's Start good. looking in Revelation. I had somebody contact me, a young man is 28, wanted to take my class because he's terrified that the second coming is about to happen. And he's, and he's, he's partied all this time because he knew something about the Bible. And now he knows, you know, that, that we are in, we are into things now. Well, there's, there's, there's one of two things that will compel you to come to Christ. And the first one is love. And the second one is fear. And yep. um, so, <laughs> so if love doesn't do it, then fear just might. <laughs> yeah. And it's so I, it's I, a I, fearful I, thing to fall into the hands of, of of, a, of, a, of a, what does it say? Uh, hands of a, of a vengeful. I don't know vengeful. I don't know what yeah. the word is, but you know what I'm saying. So, the um, yeah, yeah, I can understand. You know, so the um, a lot of people waking up and uh, paying attention that may not. Well, you would hope so. I mean, there's a lot of people praying for a third great awakening. A lot of people, you know, praying for. You know, I've I've had the three R words in my head that during this time we all need to be about, you know, reflection, reflection of not, you know, uh, it, there's a whole lot of people that need to kind of re reevaluate, you know, their priorities. And um, then there, the second R word is to repent. There's, there's things that people, we need to repent of that. We've let, we've, we've allowed a lot of worldliness to, to, right. to creep in. And then the second, and then the third word is, is, is revive. And it's um, so uh, reflect, repent, and revive. I think those are the words that are in my spirit for this time. And it's um, and um, and really kind of in that order. And it's um, and uh, because God wants to revive His church, He wants to revive. And I and I pray that this revival sweeps not just this country but the whole world. Amen. And it's uh, it would be a marvelous thing if that would be the the kind of silver lining of this crisis that we're in you're right you're right he's a merciful Elohim. it is not his will that, that people be destroyed it's it's his will that we turn him and uh, come back to him it's, it's amen purpose. so yeah he's a loving people say well he's such a vengeful god why is he doing this well it's it's yeah the this is this is not vengeance uh, yeah, this no. is this is this is nothing compared to what's going to happen when we really get into the into the revelation stuff um this is this is this is a warning shot across the bow and it's um and and the next time won't be a warning the ne the, the next one will be a true it will a will be a true blue judgment and it's um so um, so this is this is really an act of mercy to uh, to wake up the church. Amen. All right, brother. All right. I want to appreciate well, uh, I appreciate you hanging out with us and letting us uh, show you. Absolutely, stuff. it's been great. I'm really really glad we could we could make it happen. So, um, and I look forward to doing it again. And you know, looking some other looking at some other passages uh, passages and and um, so yeah, I, I was, was we'll show you what we have in the Tanakh. T tonight we focused on the the uh, New Testament, so we haven't looked even. Okay, at it great. I see Scott's already left, but uh, he kept. He's uh, lost his signal, so he's he dropped. Oh, okay, it. Yeah. okay. Well, we'll 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 chat again soon, Jonathan. I really appreciate it. All right, shalom, brother. May you bless you. Shalom. God bless. Shalom. Okay. <laughs> Take care. Bye bye.